Hi, my name is Carrie Ann Grippo Pike, also known as No White Photographer. Before I begin the lesson, I thought I would quickly tell you a little bit about myself, my background, and how I got to where I am today. I've been a professional photographer for over 20 years, getting my DBA, doing business as, and opening Capture by Carrie Photography and Product Shop in 1996. I was also a full time staff photojournalist at our local newspaper for 14 years. And then I decided to leave so I could concentrate on my business 110%. So for about three to four years after leaving the world of media behind, all I did was client photo shoots with newborns, toddlers, kiddos, families, maternity, engagements, and weddings. But my true passion and niche was always animals, wildlife, nature, and landscape photography. So I started to showcase more images like that on my Facebook fan page, and my fans and fellow photographers started requesting the animals, weather elements, and scenes to see if I could sell them so they could incorporate them into their own work. And I realized I had like all these potential stock photos just sitting on my laptop hard drive, and I knew all these talented artists and photographers could give them a new and an amazing home in their composite images. I had items and critters other photographers might not have access to where they lived, or animals obviously too dangerous to really pose a child with, like a lion, or landscapes that were just not possible to shoot in depending on location, or scenes depicting certain seasons that were needed by artists. So in April 2014, I opened an online store, and I'll show you right here. Uh, and this is where I sell instant digital downloads of overlays, textures, and digital backgrounds. So, just go through all that. Um, it's very successful. So, as of last year, you know, I made the decision to no longer do any photo sessions for clients so I could devote all my time to taking and creating images to help photographers achieve their artistic and creative ideas in their work and make their vision, you know, come alive. Um, so, I'm now taking the remainder of this year to create you know, more see-through ping overlay files. I'm traveling the U.S. to finish shooting some potential products, and I'm stocking up my store with all brand new, high-quality, high-resolution items for you to use. And so a lot of this stuff here um, I will keep, or I might combine with my new things. Um, a lot of this stuff is very old, old, you know, bad quality. It's It was all I had at the time, especially the ones near the bottom. Um, and so I've redone all those, and it'll, it's just taking a while to get it all together and work on it. And I might actually go to a different um, host site, but I will make announcements about all that. But yes, come over here and stop by and, you know, see what I have to offer. But also feel free to sign up for my newsletter, and that is on my fan page here, Captured by Carrie Photography and Product Shop. And you know, it, and you can you can access this by going under the more little tab, and then it says join my mailing list. And um, this is where through my newsletter I will make announcements about sales, new products in my shop, and I sometimes I look for testers to try out my items. But anyway, I am just so honored, you know, to be among this talented group of photographers and artists here at the Creative Artist Collection Volume Two. And I hope with this post-processing tutorial video, you know, that I can help inspire you, reignite your own creativity, motivate you, and teach you a few useful things that you can use in your own work. So, as the resident wildlife composite teacher of the bunch, today I'm going to show you how I edit this image start to finish. Here is the original, right here. And here is the original elements that I'm going to use. Right there. And as you saw, here is the finished product. Um, and not only that, but you will also get the same polar bear digital background free as my gift to you, exclusive just to participants of this creative artist library. Um, and you're, you're going to get this one here, which is unedited so that you could do whatever you want to it. You could add your own sky, you can darken it, you can cut the polar bear out, you could add snow on the ground, it's totally your choice. 
Um, but anyway, I'm always on the lookout for things that would make good digital backgrounds and overlays. And, you know, I also try to, you know, photograph suggestions and requests. And a polar bear was on the list. And he must have known I was coming because he, like, posed so perfectly on this grassy dandelion covered hill in his Toronto Zoo enclosure. Like, I never even knew polar bears liked grass, but this one and all his fellow bears were loving warm sunshine and the fresh air as they lounged on the hill outside. So, I'm going to take you through treating this shot step by step from beginning to end the way I edit an image every single time. And, you know, I hope you'll learn some new and unique ways of post-processing through this and that I can help fine-tune your editing workflow. Um, and just for reference, I have a 15-inch MacBook Pro laptop, and my software includes using Photoshop CC Creative Cloud, which is the newest version, so that's right here. And I also have Lightroom 5, and that's right here, um, to process my pictures. Now, actually, this is a package deal. I did have Photoshop CS6, um, but unfortunately, you know, they now they're offering, I got a new laptop and I couldn't move it over. And um, the only way to get any of the software now is to get it monthly. And it really does make all the difference because they fix glitches and add new tools and stuff. You know, behind the scene, it's just constantly updating Lightroom 5 and Photoshop CC. And then you won't have to go out and buy a whole new package like I used to have to, you know, upgrade Photoshop once in a while. And the tools and all the little, you know, just how sensitive it is to what you're editing is so amazing. I absolutely love this version and it is such a good deal because you get both together. So that is what I use um, to do my editing. And I think that, where's my picture? I think that my style, I guess, is whimsical, imaginary, you know, storybook, especially with just like my animal and wildlife images. You know, I like to imagine what they might look like in a children's storybook and tell a creative story with it. As my photo editor and boss at the newspaper always said, there is no right or wrong way to go about tackling an image to edit as long as the end result is satisfying to you and or your client. In fact, I mean, I think that all our finished products are works of art, but we all take different paths to achieve the final result that pleases our eye. Uh, for me to stay somewhat consistent with like a, so to speak, trademark look, and so my brain is not constantly spinning around with remembering all the tasks to do while I'm editing. I actually have all the steps written down in the order that suits my workflow best. So I actually refer to that list every single time I edit. And here I will explain every move I make in order from beginning to end. But one more thing, you know, before we get to the computer part, I just want to quickly chat about preparing before your actual photo session. Like if you know you want or need a certain overlay or digital background, you know, to be incorporated into your work, you can pre-plan your shoot around those products instead of after the fact. So this way, by drafting it out with a quick sketch on paper, writing down some pose ideas, or printing out the overlay or digital background you're planning on using so you have a visual in front of you, you know, you can then you can pose your clients with the correct body angles and positions. Like, for example, hugging the bear. Have your little client hug a pillow to make it look real, and then you replace the pillow with the bear overlay in Photoshop. You can also pay attention to your client's facial expressions. For example, if you knew you were going to use my fox overlay, the one where he looks like he is smiling really big, then you have your client copy that look so it looks like the fox and client are purposely posing that way together. Or if you want your client to be posing on the top of a mountain, look down at the digital background over, you know, sample you printed out to direct the client where to place his feet and legs to look as if he is truly standing on rocks or a boulder and then later cut out your client and you add him into the correct area you chose to place him into on the digital background. So it just speeds up your workflow process, you know, on the computer if you've already, you know, reenacted it in real life before your camera. It just, it just makes it look more real. And it's much easier to make, you know, to blend into the, the overlay or the digital background once you're working. 
Alrighty, here we go. So time to open up the raw, you know, straight out of the camera image you're going to work with. And in this case, we're going to work with this, which is again, you're going to get free here, this free digital background of the polar bear on the grassy hill. And you want to make sure it's completely, you know, unedited and not touched by anything yet. Now, there's a few little clouds behind him here, little pink clouds, but I want to add a little something more dramatic to give the sky, you know, and this empty space some texture and depth. So first I'm going to show you how to apply a sky overlay to a photo. And we're going to use one of my cloud overlays, which are coming soon to my cotton candy collection. All right, so you're going to open the sky overlay that you want to use, uh, just like a normal photo, using file open, um, right here, so you would go under file open, or you can, you know, find where it is and drag it to your little icon. So here's the overlay we're going to use, sky overlay, and just drag it into your Photoshop icon, and it'll open it that way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Then um, you want to select this cloud overlay somehow. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. I will show you the three methods, and then you can just use whatever works best for you. On a Mac, we have, you know, short, like keyboard shortcuts. And if you, if you click Command A, it puts the marching ants around it. So that's, you know, selecting all. Another way you can select all is you would go up here to the top menu bar and you're going to go to the word select here and you're going to press that and there'll be a drop down and you go right to the word all and again the marching ants go around the picture. Um, so that's how you would select it. Now the next step once you have it selected is you need to copy it so it's Command C as your keyboard shortcut, or another way to copy it is you go to Edit up here at the menu bar. You press that and you work your way down to the word Copy. So now you've selected all, you've copied all. Now you need to paste this somehow over the image you're going to work with. So again, keyboard shortcut for a Mac is Command V or you can go up here to edit and you you hit you would hit the word paste so that those are you know a few different ways that you can select copy and then proceed to paste your image and you would select the image and so I'm just using the keyboard shortcut Command V one more way that you can get one object into another picture, so an overlay or, you know, like a sky overlay or an animal overlay, you would grab your move tool right here, this little X thing. So you would go back to your sky overlay, you grab the move tool, and you just simply drag over to the picture. It'll just move it right on top. So, you know, um, it's really just, there's so many various steps and there's so many tasks, but it all that depends on your computer configuration, your software, your keyboard shortcuts that you have set up, and, you know, really your preference. So I like to use the, you know, the shortcuts on the keyboard, but Sometimes I'm in the middle of something and I'm not thinking and I do it another way. It really doesn't matter. All different methods get you to what, you know, you want to achieve. Okay, so now you have the sky overlay on your picture and you want to move it, you know, place it where you want to go. One thing I do so I can actually see where I'm putting it is I go over here to the layers, click layers, and I change the opacity to like 50% just so I can see through it, so I can, you know, get a better idea where I want to put it. And so you grab your move tool, you grab your sky overlay, and move it around where you might want it to go. Now, I personally like to, you know, leave it below the horizon line here, so I have some blending room later on. Um, 
I think I'm going to move it right about there. You can also go to, you know, free transform. And I do that through keyboard shortcuts. And I just hold down my shift key and grab this little box down here. That way it still stays to scale when I'm moving, like the clouds stay in the position they are and they don't get squished or m made to look funny if you keep it with the shift key as you move it. But, but you could use free transform here as well under the edit. I just like to just actually use the keyboard. So I think that looks good. Just make sure the sky is covering the whole image and I think that's where I'm going to put it. Okay, so then you want to place this. You can either hit this little check mark up here, which places and applies the you know overlay. I'm not sure if every, you know, all the software has that. So another method is you double click. That's what I do. So now you've set the overlay and you know the, the sky overlay on top of your photo. It's like embedded now on it. So you can use the check mark or double click. Um, okay, so now you're going to come over here to layers in your palette. Let me close this so it's not distracting. Okay, so you're going to come over here to layers in your palette and you're going to turn the visibility, this little eyeball, you're going to turn the visibility off on this layer like that. So this guy disappears for a minute and you're going to use your mouse and select the background layer. Now, from here, you're going to come over and grab your magic wand tool in your toolbar. So, magic wand tool. And with this tool, you're going to click the area that you want to apply the sky to only. So, I want this guy here. And using your shift key, see this little area here? It didn't grab all that. You just, you know, keep clicking where the marching ants might not have initially grabbed. So there's a little spot right here and you can blow it up and using your shift key, you know, actually get in between all the little blades of grass and you can be very careful, you know, how you really want to fill it all in just for the saving time in this tutorial. I think this looks good enough, but you know, blow it up real quick and, and just make sure it's grabbed what, you know, it, ha it hasn't grabbed too much or, it's grab just what you need because that is where the sky is going to go, where all those marching ants are. Um, so now, once you've selected all the area with your magic wand tool, you're going to go back here to your layers. You're going to look at your sky layer and you're going to click it. Then you're going to click the visibility back on with the little eyeball here. And now you're going to come down here and click this layer mask button, which right here is a little bot, a little square with a circle in it. So now as you can see, the sky has been placed. There's before with a little pink puffy cloud and there's my overlay. And it, it plopped in right where I directed it to with the, man, you know, the marching ants. I am going to leave this sky overlay at about 70% opacity. So make sure your sky overlay layer here is selected and change the opacity. If I were to bring it all the way up to 100, see right here, I think it looks too saturated, too dark for the surroundings. You can see a lot of, you know, how it didn't grab all the fur. And even if you were super duper careful and took your time, I just think it's, it's too strong. And especially since there was, you know, already a blue sky to begin with, I think that making it about 70% um, is just less, har less harsh and it helps it blend in better to the horizon and the grass. Now you can always darken the sky later with a variety of tools because you, you have it there now, you didn't have it before. But I think I just, I always like to make it a little more gentle unless you have like trees or a building or something back there. We just didn't have anything. And then you, you probably would need to go, well, 100% in order to cover up that unless you stamped out the building and the trees beforehand. And that's, that's really time consuming. So um, if, but if you have the opportunity to go a little 
less harsh with your opacity, go for it. Okay, so now um, you need to clean up where the sky did, did not really go. So you're going to, now that you have your little layer mask right there, you're going to come over here to your palette of tools and you're going to grab your white brush. So make sure it's white down here. White. And I'm going to be working with little blades of grass and stuff, so I don't know, I think I'll just use about a size 15 brush. And you want to make sure your hardness is at zero. And I like to have the opacity up here at 88, you know, 88 or whatever, so it's not like 100% erasing or adding in, because if you make a mistake, you can flip to black and repaint over it. But I just think that it, it just makes it a little gradual from, from where you're cloning. Or painting actually you're not cloning so what you want to do is get rid of any jagged lines um, so I'm gonna come down here and it all looks pretty good down here I'll blow it up so you can see it um, in here a little bit oops I'm so sorry don't know why Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the reason that's not working, so this is good for the tutorial. I'm like, why isn't this doing it right? You have to make sure you click on the what you want to paint. So you have to click on your new, the layer mask here that you've created when you came down to this little square. So that's why it wasn't working. So again, make sure you're on your white brush and you can just start, you know, this is too, you know, just painting away. I'm doing this super quick just to show you, you know, paint away the little jagged yellow line, the jagged white lines that you might see where the sky overlay just didn't quite fill everything in. Um, you can keep changing your opacity here and the flow if you think it was it's too you know much. It seemed to do a pretty good job on this side. Again, I'm going really quick. Normally, I would open it up and you know really get inside every blade of grass the right way with a much smaller brush but I just want to show you that you're painting away any anywhere that it didn't get so first I'm gonna concentrate on the grass and over here you can see there's a lot more that it it didn't get so again I'm super quick just and you can if you didn't like this you know you could actually get rid of the whole blade of grass if you just kept painting but I'm just trying to get rid of that jagged white line because I didn't even really do a very good job with my match marching ants. So again, the more careful you are with every step that you make, the less little mistakes you'll have here. But this is just simply to show you blending it in. Now when you get to the fur, like on an animal, you got to be even more careful. So I'm going to turn my brush hardness to about like 22%. So it's a, a little bit softer. And when you are dealing with a jagged line around the fur, I actually kind of go up and down in a sweeping motion, you know, make it a regular up and down random to simulate the scruffy hairs on the bear. And you really want to zoom in close, go even closer than that, you know, to, to make sure that you're getting all those little sections that became jagged from the cloud overlay. Um, you want to make sure you correctly adjust these edges and again if you make a mistake so say I went oops I went in too far and I got rid of too much you simply change your brush color back to to black so go to the black color here and you can you can repaint it back so that's that's what's so nice it you can always redo your mistakes you just flip your color to black and you can undo the painting that you're doing if you make a boo-boo. Um, so again, you're just going to, with your white brush, keep going around and fixing all this jagged line here. And again, I'm going really fast. I just want to show you how to better blend things. If you feel you need more opacity and flow, change it where you are. But even though it's a little time-consuming, 
you know, you are adding something that wasn't there. So you, in order to make it look real and natural, you really just do have to take your time. And, and just like any work of art, it takes a long time to get it right. And to make it look real, you just have to go slow. So again, I, but I'm going fast because I'm trying to just show you the tools here that you have. And that all looks pretty good. Let me fix some of this. And again, oops, I made a mistake. Go to your black and paint it back. That's what's nice about work, working layers. They're very forgiving. And just keep painting the jagged line. Come over here. Check out what went wrong. But I'm, you know, the Photoshop Creative Cloud is really smart. When you do it right and you go slow, it, it's like it can tell what you want it to do. So I just, you know, the creations have been much more believable and I don't even have to do as much because the software knows exactly what you're trying to achieve. Um, okay, so now you have everything, you know, painted away and you got rid of all your jagged lines. Here's a trick. Before you, you know, are going to flatten this or go on to the next step, you can select your sky layer. So you come over here to your palette, you select the sky. And because you are just selecting the sky layer, you now have the option to adjust it. And you're not going to affect the bear, you're not going to affect the grass. So, like Command M is a shortcut on a Mac. Or if you wanted to go under Image, adjustments, curves, both those ways will get you to curves. You can darken the sky, I'm going, you know, lighten the sky, I'm going very dramatic, just to show you. Or you can darken the sky. Um, and, but you're not, a, you know, altering anything else. And of course that's way too much. And then you'll have to go in there and fiddle again with all the jagged lines that we show up. But it's just to show you that, you know, you can, you can alter it. You can, you can add yellow. You can make a really bluish purple, but you're not affecting anything else. Um, another thing you can do, because your sky layer is selected, you can, you can blur it more. You can sharpen it a little bit. As long as you have this layer selected, you could do whatever you want to it. But I don't think we need to do anything. I'm leaving it alone. That's just an option in general for any overlay or anything you add to a photo. As long as that particular layer, just that, is selected, you can alter it without changing anything else. Um, okay, so that's what's nice about layers. So I think that looks pretty good. Um, I think I'm going to take my white brush once more and come over here, click on white. This time I'm going to make the brush go up here. I'm going to make it really big, like 333. I'm going to make the you know opacity 22 and the flow 22 and make sure the hardness is about 22. Can you tell that's my favorite number? And I'm going to just, I may even make that like 555. Five, five. I'm just sweeping over everything really quickly, kind of blends it all in, anything I might have missed. It just kind of ties it all together, just go around one time. It's, everything is gentle. It's just kind of melding it all together. Everything is such a low opacity, a low flow. A soft brush but it, I don't know I just I always like to just go through one time and sometimes you don't want to be too careful you you don't want to be too perfect or it looks fake so you just you know you just sweep around all right so I think when you're satisfied that it looks good you want to flatten this image because this is this is it this is your next step in your creation so I you can you go down here to or up here actually to um, You go up here, don't know where it's going here, no. Layer, layer, flatten image. And now you want to save the image someplace. So for me, any big changes that I make, anything I do to alter the photo in a big way, after I flatten that particular edit, I actually save it with a name indicating what big move happened. 
So I can go back later to certain scenes if I need to. Like, so for this, I'm going to title it IMG 6130 Clouds, because that's what we just did. And I'll stick it here in my online class so I can access this. But, you know, put it whatever folder you want, wherever you want in your desktop. And it has, so it has its own specific name. I know that this version, we did something with the clouds. JPEG. There we go. And I will just reopen that so that we're working with a fresh, flattened image. So I go to IMG 6130 Clouds and open that up. Close that. Close these up because they're in the way. All right, so now the next thing I like to do before I add in anything else is I just want to clean up this grass a bit and I want to add in some more dandelions because they were only in this one little spot. So, first, I want to get rid of the ugly, distracting blades of grass here. You come over and you grab your clone tool, this little guy right here. Make sure it says clone stamp tool. And make sure the opacity is 100% and the flow is 100% up here. And you want to start stamping. And you want to clone from, you know, you want to clone from various areas to make it, if you know, make it believable. You don't want to clone grass right there because then it would be the same pattern grass. So I grab a little over here and cover it over here. Grab a little here and cover it here. I, I don't really like to pick something right next to it and just kind of, you know, fix it in a jagged way that grass would be. So you can obviously change the size. You're getting into little, you know, small areas. But basically, I just grab a little grass, get rid of a little grass. All right, so now I got rid of all the ugly blades of grass. Now it's time to clone the dandelions. Don't pick the same clusters, obviously. You want to grab different parts and mix them together and, you know, kind of make sure there's no duplicates. So I might grab this dandelion here and just keep them alone. Might grab this dandelion here and put it way down here. Then I might add this dandelion here way over here. And you just keep cloning without duplicating the actual clusters you just you, you know you might combine these two which didn't happen over here so just to make sure that there's no repetition you don't just want to grab this whole cluster like I'll show you if you grab this whole cluster and re and redo it it's the same thing right here and anyone that really looks closely at your photo will say well there's the same pattern right there you don't want to do that so just grab a little here a little there and then and put them in believable places as you can see these aren't all the way in the frame Another idea too, and I didn't have this, but say you had this polar bear, you know, a frame before it, a frame after it, and you, you happen to have more of the grass down here below, and it was the same distance away, so the dandelions were the same size, then you would simply, you know, clone from another picture. You would just open another picture right here, grab it, and, and click on this photo, and paint it in. So you could, you could select... Um, flowers from another image and place them here. You could use your lasso tool and put them in here and blend it. And there's so many ways, but I'm just, I, didn't, I only had this one particular um, version and anything nearby 6129 was way far away and they were too small. And 6131, I hardly had any grass in it at all. So, but that's another thing to pay attention to. You can always use a photo before or after to add into what you're working on. Just add a couple more. Oops. All right. So I think there's some new yellow in there now, and that looks pretty good. Cool. All right. So now we have done the cloning. We've done the stamping, um, and I think it looks pretty good. Um, so now I made a new move. I added dandelions. So I'm going to save this and I'm going to add the word dandelions. So now I have two versions. I have just the clouds and I have clouds dandelions. 
and I'm just going to keep doing that every time I make a big change. I mean, that's the way I work, but I do find that if I make a big mistake, something happens and the power goes out and I lose what I'm working on, at least I have all that hard work I did with the versions prior. All right, so I'm saving that and closing and opening it again. That way you're working from a fresh, flattened version. So there's my cloud stand lines. Now, it is time to add the penguin. And I'm gonna open up the penguin overlay in Photoshop, just like I would any other file. So again, you can go you know, to File, Open, and I would find where it is on the computer, or you just find where it is and you can drag it to Photoshop, or double click it, whatever. It's Even though it's a ping file, P-I-N-G, it is still a Photoshop element. So it might not open up as a JPEG, but it is still a file you can access through Photoshop. Um, so anyway, this is a see-through ping file. This is what I make for you, and it's all ready to add into any of your images. You don't have to get rid of any background. You don't have to, it's all there for you. It's see-through, you can move him around. He's ready to go. Um, and this cute guy here, he will be ready to purchase soon from my shop. He'll be on a big template of numerous penguins, with different looks and poses. I do like to try to give you a lot of options on one sheet. Um, so anyway, again, this is the same thing as working with the sky overlay. You're gonna select all, and I use my keyboard shortcut, Command A, where you could follow what I you know, directed you to with the sky overlay. Same thing, there's you know, a bunch of different ways to move something onto another picture, but I love my keyboard shortcut. So I'm going Command All. Then, of course, you need to copy what's inside the ants. You hit Command-C, or again, up here, you will go and do the pull-downs and grab copy. And the final step, of course, is you need to paste it into what you're working on. So Command-V is paste, or you would go up here and, and find you know the drop-down for paste. So now I'm pasting using Command-V, v, the uh, penguin, into my the picture I'm working on. And of course he's super big and everything, but as you can see, he's see-through. You don't see these little checks or anything anymore. There he is, he's free floating. And you grab your move tool, and this is how you're gonna size and move him down. Again, you want to keep him to scale. So if you're you know, free transforming this, right here under edit, or I use the actual to move tool, you wanna grab the corners and hold down the shift key while you move it. So he stays to scale. So there he is, he's getting smaller and smaller. You grab the middle part just with your mouse and you can move them. You can grab these corners and you see a little, you know, curved double arrow and that means you can, you can tilt him. So I am going to keep going down here and I wanna, you know, keep moving them to where I think he would be believably sized and also in a position I think is cute. Being nose to nose. And I think that looks pretty good. And once you um, get him where you want, like I said, his nose matches up with the bear and that he's a realistic size, you just double click or click this check mark, as I said, to quote, place him. Um, you know, you need to think about scale and placement of any overlay in your image. For example, is the animal realistically sized in relation to a small child? Uh, for example, like you don't want the wolf to be too big next to the kid or the draft to be too short. So if this scene happened in real life, you need to visualize exactly how big or how tall the animal is in relation to the size of the person or the other animal in the shot, or for, for you know, calculate for the distance away from the subject. Um, you can even like Google, I've done this, I've Googled images of like kid holding a koala bear in hopes that someone has something like that on the internet. You know, there's pictures somewhere of maybe what you're intending to do. Maybe there's a zookeeper that's standing next to a lion and they'll just give you a reference point 
to start with so that you can alter that in your own image. Um, okay, so let's see here. You know, you also want to consider the angle. If someone is standing a bit to the side, you want to choose an animal overlay that is also at a small angle. You want to put the subjects on the same plane too. So you have to look down at their feet or, you know, what they're standing on. Um, you know, make sure the feet is lined up. And I think this is fine because I might even move him a little smaller and get him off the grass just a little. But I did want to leave him on the grass just to show you something about that. So consider all those things. Um, so now you've added your animal overlay there. And another tip and trick, again, like we talked about before, is just select your penguin. So up here in layer, in your, your layers palette, there he is right there, layer one. That's your penguin. Just grab that and you can alter it to match the image you placed it in. So again, using curves, command M, keyboard shortcut. You can darken them and lighten them so there is really light. Say the polar bear was really light, they would match. You can darken them if you needed to. You could add yellow to him if you felt he needed to have a little bit of the tones of the bear. Um, I actually might just add a whisker of yellow to him, just a whisker. Because the bear seems to have a little yellow cast on, which we're going to remove later. But you want it to look as, you know, matchy-matchy as possible before you really get to the editing. Because, again, if this scene was real and the penguin was really there, he would, he would be the same hue, tone, lighting conditions as the bear. So you can choose that overlay and make them that way before you really begin, you know, adding actions, and presets, or doing editing by hand. Another thing you can do when that layer mask is selected is you can, um, you know, even blur or sharpen him. If you look at the polar bear, he's not tack tack sharp, but the penguin actually is. So I like to go up here under filter, the pull down, to blur, to Gaussian blur, and about, I landed on 0.5, and that's what I was going to say, about a 0.5, you know, you just kind of, Fuzzies it out a little to equal the bear so he's not as tack sharp. You could go really extreme and you don't need that. But you could, you know, if you were putting an overlay way in the background or way in the foreground, like he was, you know, photo bombing a photo, you might consider using the, the Gaussian blur very extreme to make it realistic. Because if the penguin is way, way, way back or really, really, really close to the frame, that keeps it real as well. And that's a great way to do it. But you've got to make sure you just select that layer. Otherwise, you'd be altering the whole photo. So, anyway, I'm going back to 0.5. Then you hit OK. And now, you want to make sure that the penguin looks OK. So you're going to blow up your image even more right to the penguin. And now you're just going to focus on him. Sometimes overlays appear to have a white border and a white line around them, and that's just due to color channel changes. So you want to make sure that you manually, manually remove this white line. Um, if you saw something, which I do not, but say you did, you would do the same thing as with the sky overlay. You would come down here, hit this little add layer mask button, which is the square with the circle, and you would use your brush, and you would choose a size that's fitting. 12 would look good. Maybe uh, hardness of 12, your opacity 88, and flow 88. And if there was something there, oops, this time you're going to use your black brush, though, because you're, you're actually on it. You're, you're actually dealing with the overlay and you're altering the background behind them, but I'm just pretending that was a line. You would use your black brush and fix any little irregularities that you did see. And if you made a mistake, oops, I got rid of too much of him, you would switch it over to white and paint it back in. 
The reason that it's opposite of the sky is because we were we were working around the sky. This time we're actually working with the overlay. But it really doesn't matter. I mean, try it out. I can't ever remember. I, I grabbed the wrong color and you can immediately see you're doing the wrong thing. But you always want to make sure you're on in the layers palette, you're on the overlay that you're altering. Okay, so he looked fine though. There was no white border, no white line, but you, again, you really want to just go around your animal or whatever you've added and check it out. Make sure it's well blended into the surroundings. The better job that you do and the more careful that you are, the more believable and realistic it will be. Once you're satisfied, all of this looks okay, you're going to flatten this image so that this penguin becomes part of all of this picture here. Um, so you're going to go to Layer, Flatten Image. And again, I just made a big move. I added Mr. Penguin. And really, before you, if you flatten it, that's it. You can't move it. Of course, you could always reopen it, grab your lasso tool, copy it, paste it, move the penguin an inch, but then you'd have to, you know, stamp out part of the penguin because you moved them. So you really want to make sure you're good to go. This is just the way I operate. Some people leave it in layers the entire time they're editing, but again, that makes me nervous. If something happens with my computer, I did all that, all that work, all those steps, and I didn't have anything saved. You could also duplicate it and save different chunks of it as well and keep working on a version with just layers. But that's just not my preference. That's not what I do. Once I'm satisfied, then that's it. And uh, so now I'm going to title this IMG 6130 Cloud Standalines. And we made a move with the penguin, so I'm going to add that in there. So now I'm going to close it, close in, and go back and open up the version that's been flattened and saved. So we have a nice fresh picture to work with. Okay. Now, remember, it's the small things that make a big difference. It really, really is. Little things are big things. So you you really want to pay attention to everything. And so you don't you don't you don't want to forget to blend things over your overlays such as grass. I just placed the penguin on top of the grass. Well, that doesn't look real. He's not sinking in. There's no, you know, look at the bear. He has grass blades over his feet and little pieces of grass sticking up over his leg. But the penguin, he wouldn't just be standing on a blade of grass like that. So I have some tips and tricks about how to add some grass back. What you're going to do is you're going to click on this background layer here. So that's all you have right now containing the grass. You're going to get your free hand lasso tool. So you come up here, this little ropey thing. Make sure you're grabbing just the lasso tool and just quickly cut out a free hand selection of some grass near him. Let's see, I'm going to go grab this grass. That's all, just a little, little area. So see where the marching ants are? That's just what I want to grab. Then you want to copy, cut, you know, Co copy that selection of marching ants. So again, I'm going Command C, or you could you could come up here and, and use your um, Edit, pull down, copy. Again, whatever preference is good for you. And now you need to paste. So again, Command V on a Mac, or you come up to Edit and Paste. So I'm just simply copying and pasting. You're going to move, see what I just cut out, this grass selection over your penguin, moving your move tool up here. Keep it how it is. Don't make it bigger. Don't make it smaller because, you know, nothing has changed. You're just moving some grass over him. You just put it where you want. All right, so you've moved your grass over your penguin. And... Now you need to place it. So again, you can use the check mark or I'm I'm gonna double click my selection. Alright, so now 
you're going to add a layer mask. Come over here to your palette, click this little, as we have been doing, this little square with a circle, and you're going to add a layer mask. Now, you need to make this layer mask right here, you need to make it black. There's a, a bunch of different ways you can do that, but if you just click on it and you hit Command-I, that will invert it. You want to invert it. Another way um, you can do that is you go to Image up here at the top. You do the pull-down. You go to Adjustments and you scroll down to invert and that would change it too. You just have to make sure you're grabbing onto that. And the reason that you need to make the layer mask black is because white reveals and black conceals, which it obviously just did. You saw it disappear from, from him, the grass. So now that you have done that, you're going to go to your brush tool. Come over here to your working palette. You're going to pick your brush. You're going to come up here, you're going to click on this little arrow, and this is your brush palette where you can choose from all these different brushes. Now, I'm pretty sure many versions of Photoshop have this. I had it in many different, at least five and C, uh, CS6 extended and for sure Photoshop CC. Number one, if you scroll through all the brushes, there's a lot that are preloaded. I, I also make my own brushes. I find them for free on the internet, I buy them, so as you can see I have a lot of things in here. But preloaded into your brush palette, number 134 is this little blade of grass. It comes with your mat. It's there by default, it resembles grass blades. You're going to click on this little box here next to it once you've selected your grass blades of 134. And it opens up a little, you know, dialog box where you could play around more to make it look like the grass you want. Now, when you're doing this trick that we're going to do of adding grass back over the penguin, you're going to close everything here on the side except shape dynamics and scattering. Those are the only two things that you want. You're going to hit shape dyna dynamics. We're going to deal with that first. Shape Dynamics, you're going to come over here to the word Size Jitter. Size Jitter means every single time you press down and use, you know, your brush stroke, it's, it's going to vary the size of the grass automatically because all grass is different lengths and that will help with realism. So I'm going to set it here to about eh, 82% and you can see it change on the bottom. So that's, you know, it just shows you what you're going to get but 82 has seemed to work for me in the past. Um, now, angle jitter is the other thing you're gonna alter within the shape dynamics box. Angle jitter means every time you lay down a new brush stroke, it's gonna vary the angle of the grass. Again, it helps with the realism. And I'm gonna set that to 10, it already is 10, but again, you can, you can see the grass twirling around and all these different angles, but 10 will work for what I'm dealing with. And you, and you can see, you know, you can match it to what you want. All right, so you want to come over here and close that. You want to make sure your brush is white and you're simply painting back the grass you placed over the penguin. Make sure you're clicked on the black box here. It won't work if you click on the overlay you want. You're painting back the grass, which is hidden by the black. So make sure you click on this and just start painting. I'll blow it up so you can see more. Oh, by the way, I like to use an opacity of 77 and flow of 77 because, again, I think it makes it more gradual and a little bit see-through as grass blades would be. So just let the brush do it for you. As you can see, I'm just painting back part of the overlay that I laid over him. The higher up you go with where you plop your, um, your you know, selected, when you free 
handed the grass, the more it'll show up high. I only yeah, probably ended it near his wings. I mean, it doesn't look like the grass goes up much higher than that. So, you know, just get, get it where you want. And so now it looks like he's in the grass. He's part of the grass. You can still see his foot, but he wouldn't just be standing on blades of grass without there being a little bit of a crunch down. So there we go. I think that looks good. But that's just a good tool to know. When you're ever working with grass or wheat or snow or anything that comes up over an animal or any object that you put place into your photo that wasn't originally there. Uh, so I think that looks good. Um, you, you know, another thing you might want to check, and it doesn't come into play here, but say there was a, a tree limb behind him or a building, you'll want to blow it up and make sure that what's behind the penguin wasn't taken away too much so that if there's a tree limb, it really comes from behind him and goes the other way. You want to make sure what's behind your objects are also, you know, realistically there just as much as what's in front of your objects or your overlays that you've added. Um, so now I think that all looks good. Um, like I said, it's just clouds behind them and they're flowing right behind them in a good way. So it's time to save our new move here, which I'm going to layer, flatten. So now I'm flattening the grass layer. I'm going to save this, call it IMG 6130 Clouds, Dandelions, Penguin, Grass. I know that's a lot of words and you can use your own keywords and keep it short or whatever. I'm just doing this for the tutorial. And uh, as they say, better save than sorry. So save, save, save. Even save when you're in the middle of doing step by step once it comes to the actions. It's just, it's always important to save your work. So I'm saving, grass. Closing, opening, a fresh new flattened version now, as you can see, with the grass. So look at all the steps that we have gone through. But now we have this, you know, brand new template to work with. And if we make a mistake, heaven forbid, or the power goes out, you can go back to that edit and reopen that. You won't have lost all these other things you were working on. It took a long time for us to get to this stage. So now you have it. Okay, so just so you know, in general, another tip or trick to consider and remember, like with animal overlays, you want to make sure the fur is showing around the person. So say you add a person hugging this bear instead of a penguin here or whatever. You, you know, they're hugging it or they're holding it or they're laying on it. You want to make sure the fur is visible on their bodies, on their hands, on their clothes to make it realistic looking. So use the same technique as the grass, except you would clone a little fur and do exactly what I would do. So always consider those just tiny little things like the grass, so tiny little things like the fur that just makes it more real. And lighting is also a major factor to consider when you're incorporating an overlay. So is there real sun shining on the left side of your subject? Then you might have to add in sunlight digitally on the left side of the animal overlay to match it. Or is your little girl subject backlit? Well, look for an animal overlay that has backlight already on it. Or you might have to add it in later via, you know, via Photoshop. For, you know, me, I try to shoot my animal overlays for you in all sorts of lighting conditions to realistically, you know, match up your lighting conditions and give you options to choose from. So I have animals in full shade, I have them in direct sun, I have them backlit, but I, sometimes I can't get it the way you might need it, and you'll have to do that digitally later in Photoshop. But just pay attention to that, um, that if there's a big sunbeam on his back coming from this side, you would need to add a sun glow coming to him from that side. Okay, so now, only after I add my overlays to an image, or only after I add my clients into a digital background, etc., do I ever begin the actual editing and treating process, and then finally flattening it into the finished product. This way, every single thing in the photo matches, and it all blends together. Like, 
you want to put all your products and elements into the unedited image first. So this includes snow overlays, rain overlays, fog overlays, firefly overlays, spider web overlays, leaf overlays, animal overlays like this guy, bubble overlays, moon overlays, cloud overlays. Anything that you were adding in because you wished it was already there, you want to make sure you add it in first before you begin your editing because the hues and the tones of Photoshop action and Lightroom presets and overall sharpening, you know, etc., it'll cover the entire image equally if you add it in first. For example, like if you add a moon overlay in once you've finished running all your actions and presets or done hand adjustments, it will not match all the moves you have made, all the hues and the tones and the color and the light and the sharpness you've already created. You must have all your elements in first. The only exception I think would be if you're adding a texture or you're running like a painting program at the end, but that goes over your entire image. But you need to make sure any overlays or elements are there before you begin actually treating your picture. Okay, so as I mentioned, I work with both Lightroom 5 and Photoshop Creative Cloud. Once in a while I use hand edits, but not often because I'm pretty addicted, you know, addicted to the Photoshop actions. Um, before I run any Photoshop actions on this image though, I want to prep it. And I actually use Lightroom for most of my prepping. Uh, sometimes my overall image is too dark, it's too light, it has too many highlights, too many shadows, if it's sunny like in this picture. Um, so I'm going to open up Lightroom, Lightroom 5, and I'm going to import this, you know, final image that we've created with the grass. So I go to Library, Import, down, find it. I'm going to pull the one that says clouds, penguins, grass. I'm going to import that image. Now, grab it, bring it into develop mode. And I'm just, I'm not, man, I'm not going to use any presets or anything like that. I'm just manually adjusting what I need. So I'm, there's too many highlights. So I'm going to come over here. And I'm going to grab highlights and bring them down. As you can see, it changes all the highlights. So here's the highlights overdone, and I'm bringing them all the way down because the bear had too many blown out areas in his fur. He was on a very sunny hill. Um, then I'm even going to grab the whites and bring them down just a little bit. It alters everything in the photo, but that's fine because now this is one image unto itself. And then I think I'm going to open up the shadows a little bit, like in here, just a whisker to show a little texture. And then I'm just going to come up here and adjust the contrast just a little so everything pops, everything blends together. And I like how that looks. Now I'm going to export this image. So I go to export. I'm going to just save it um, right here, the little folder we're working on. So choose where you want this altered image to go. I'm exporting it. You can see there it is right there. I know that that means it's been with a dash one, but you're going to open it. You're going to rename it. Again, because you just made another move. So I will call this Grass LW for Lightroom and save it. Now, as you can see, this is what we've done in Lightroom. And you can certainly use Photoshop Actions. You can use your tools here on the left hand side. They have burning and dodging. I just like to do it in Lightroom because the tools are right there with sliders. But there are so many ways to kind of prep this image one more time before you really run any sort of action or hand edit on it. Here is what it looked like before I put it into Lightroom. And here's after. As you can see, see his fur is just filled in. The shadows are opened up. And that's the image that I want to work with. So I'm going to close this Lightroom version. 
and start fresh and reopen it. And here we go. Now we're on to this next stage with this flattened Lightroom version. Now, it's time, at least what I do with my step, is to edit in Photoshop. As you can see here is my Photoshop Action Palette. I have about 75 favorites from all the different vendors I've purchased from through the years. These are my go-tos that I use on my images. Now, in real life, if I wasn't teaching this tutorial video, I would duplicate this image 75 times. I ha actually have an action that will do it for me. Um, so I just put in the number 75 and it duplicates it. It seems extreme, but it really goes fast. And what I do is I run each individual action on each copy. Every image you ever edit in Photoshop is different. And even though you might have a general idea of what an action or even what a preset, Lightroom preset, will do and how it looks, it always appears differently on every single shot you're working on due to lighting, color, exposure. So I run the action 75 times. And then I might like, you know, six, seven of them, whatever. I save those six or seven copies that I like in a folder. So again, to save time in this tutorial video, I've already gone through all my actions that I use every single day and ended up with five favorites in a folder. So everyone has their own way of doing things. I personally like, you know, to blend different versions together because I might like a little bit of one and a little bit of another. So I usually blend the photos together in layers. So I will show you. These are the five that I liked. They, I really love Wish Photography Actions. And I have all her various sets that she's sold throughout the years. And so these are from, you know, her collections. Now, she might not have many of these in her store. Sometimes she gets rid of things and blends them into to new sets. But all these happen to be, the ones I like happen to be from Wish Photography in general. So, my recipe ended up being, I loved her the way Happily ran, and I never alter an action. If it runs, it runs. I don't go into layers within each action, usually never, and adjust it. I adjust it myself by mixing and matching actions together. So, I ran, this is her Happily at 100% with no alterations. And I loved also the way her positive plus came out. But I like a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So what I'm going to do is going to select all happily, copy, and paste happily over positive plus. And I'm going to blend the two together. And I decided that I had liked it at 50% opacity and normal. As you can see, this is just positive plus, but now I put happily over it at 50%. So it's like 50% of one, 50% of another. Then I flatten this. I also like the way her maple landing looked as like a base. So I'm going to grab all of this, command all, select all, copy, and I'm going to paste that mixture here over this maple landing one and I once I tweaked around with it I felt that 50% looked good so now I have this base layer there was stuff in there that I liked with this layer here over that now um, I had a hi highlight save um, that I also liked so I'm gonna flatten this maple landing mixture that we have created Again, I'm going to add this highlight save. Command all, select all, I'm going to copy. Let's see. Command all, copy, and I'm going to paste this highlight save over this mixture. So there's what it was, that's with highlight save over it, and I'm going to make that about 44%. So basically what I just did was I have bits and pieces of all different actions blended together 
and again, I, I have just always done it in layers by blending instead of just building up different actions on top of one image by pressing the play button. You know, so some people will just have their polar bear image. They'll go through all their actions in the palette. They'll just keep hitting different ones and pressing play and going into the layers of each action and adjusting. I, I've just never done that. That's just the style. I mean, yeah, I picked it up at the newspaper when we edited photos. I'm not sure. But that's just the way I've always blended different actions together. And you don't have to use normal mode. There's so many different blending options. As you can see, you can blend them in screen, blend them in soft light. But I just feel blending as is in normal mode has worked just fine for me. Or you could just blend parts of them. You can you know, add one action layer over another action layer. And again, like I did with the penguin overlay, go to add a layer mask and paint back the action parts that you wanted. So there's unlimited ways to get to the look that you want. It's just infinite, infinite different choices. But this is just what works for me. And maybe that's something you could, you know, try out in your own editing. So again, everybody also has their own way and their own place to save images. For me, once I get to this part of editing um, where I'm using the actions, I put the letters TD in front when I save it. So I know this is the treated version. That's just the way I go once I get to this part of the game. So I am flattening all these different actions blended together in layers. I'm going to save it and I'm going to title it just what I'm going to do just to save time is grab open the the version here I'm just going to copy this title and then I'm going to add a TD in front of it so as you can see, all the moves we've made with the original 6130, the clouds, the dandelions, the penguins, the grass, the lightroom. And now I put TD up in the front part. So I know that this version is now on to the actions part. And there we go. Treated all the other moves we've made. I'm gonna close that. I'm going to open it. So now we have this fresh new flattened version with the actions applied. And now I am ready to go and, you know, start doing more tweaks to the image. These are small hand edits. Um, these are also Photoshop actions that are made for specific things. And I do apologize in advance. I cannot always recall where I got some of these actions from that I'm going to start running because I pulled them from tons of different companies that I bought from. I added them to my favorites action action palette here, and um, the company name is not always written in the title. But if I do know who made those particular actions, I will let you know. The vendor, as I work through the edit, it doesn't mean they still sell that anymore. Um, you know, whatever works for you or is similar in your own action palettes, ones you've made, ones you've come across for free, ones you have that kind of you know ones you have that do the same job that I'm doing. It's just to show you that. Um, these are more steps that I do to alter my photo how I want. But there's other ways you can get to that as well. Again, by hand or something that you might own that does a similar job. Because most vendors make actions that usually have these very basic, you know, moves inside their, their sets. Um, you know, get rid of yellow, add a little contrast. Those are like basic things that you get usually with every action set. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to do, this is a little dull, I want to brighten this up. And I'm going to come to my Actions palette, and I have a Brighten More. I'm going to run this action, and I feel that about 22% opacity is good. So that's what it was. I just popped it a little with Brighten. And then I come up here, and I flatten that move. So layer flatten. There are so many ways to brighten your image if you feel you need to. These are just the steps that I take and the moves that I make as I work through my editing. 
Next, I feel that I need to add some contrast and darken up the tones. And I actually have an action that does that. It's called Contrast Darken Tones. Don't remember where I got it from. But again, you can create your own. You can do this by hand. I'm going to run that action. And I felt that once I did this 15% opacity up here it was good. So as you can see, it just, eh, it just darkened it down, darkened down the blacks a little. It just added some contrast. It gave it a little pop. Again, like how it looks, so I'm going to layer, flatten image. The next thing I do in my editing process is I run a little vibrance to an image if I feel it needs it. It just adds a smidge of overall color. So, I'm going to run soft vibrance, hit play. Woo, that's a lot. So I felt that 12% opacity was good on this. Just, boom, just gives it a little smidge of overall color. Again, I'm happy how that looks, that opacity 12. I'm going to layer flatten my soft vibrance. Uh, the next step in my personal workflow is to sharpen an image. So I have a, an action that runs sharpening. Sharpen for print subtle. I don't remember where I got this from. I'm so sorry. Um, it's just going to sharpen it up a little. And I'm just leaving it how it is. I'm flattening it under layers. And at this point, I think I'm going to save the image. So I go to save. And yes, I just want to replace this because I like this version. I like where we're going with this. Some people keep saving new versions, but I know that I'm going to overwrite what we started out with. So replacing. Hit OK. Uh, now, I usually open up curves. Again, that's Command-M on a Mac. Or you can go up to Image, Adjustments, Curves. And with curves, eh, I, I just kind of like to adjust the overall brightness. Just open it up a, a whisker. You could do whatever you want in curves. In curves, you can add colors, you can remove color, you can make it darker, you can adjust the highlights. But at this step in the game, this is what I always do. I just kind of open up the middle part, the brightness. Then I look in the next step and what I always do is I stamp out any dust or dirt or I clone out anything that I don't want in the image. So I use my clone stamp tool here, right here in the actions, the uh, palette here, tool palette on the left. And um, I really don't see anything. There's a little dust here. Make sure your opacity is 100 and your flow is 100 and make sure your brush is the right size for what you're doing. And I'm just stamping out. There's a little dust here, a little dust there, a little piece of dirt there, but otherwise it looks pretty good. After I stamp out dust and dirt or clone anything again, I am going to save place. Okay. Now, in my personal workflow, it's vignet time. I have 14 go-tos that I once in a while use if I feel I need a little vignette, uh, which means you just kind of darken the edges and the, the focus comes into the middle because it's a little bit lighter. Um, I've already tried out my 14 go-to vignettes, and I liked the subtle color change of this one here, which is called Lemon Vignette. I don't remember where I, oh no, the Lemon Vignette and the um, Natural Vignette are both from Julia Star Photography. So here's the Natural Vignette. That's way too much. Here's the Lemon Vignette. That's way too much. So what I'm doing is Flattening the lemon, flattening the natural, grabbing, command all, selecting all, copy, and pasting the lemon over the natural, changing the opacity to about 66%. So those are lemon and natural mixed together. And I'm going to flatten 
this combination here of vignettes. And I like what that has done. It's just very subtle, but I like this version here of vignettes better than that. So, goodbye. And I'm going to save this. Of course, it says copy to, so I'm going to remove that so that I am saving and actually replacing. The next thing I often do is an action called pop what you want. I feel that Mr. Penguin looks a little dull right there with all the different, um, you know, highlights that we've adjusted. He just kind of looks a little flat. So I'm going to go to this action called pop what you want. And I'm going to use an opacity of 33 here. And in a flow of 33, this is up here at the top. And, oh, I'm sorry, a flow of 66. So it shows a little more. And I'm just going to sweep, oops, make sure you grab your brush here. going to sweep my brush. Fix this again. over Mr. Penguin. I'm going to do that again because I grabbed the wrong tool and I think it just hiccuped. So basically I'm going to reopen our latest version here. Our last saved version and try that again. Hit pop what you want. Make sure my brush is selected. Opacity of 33, flow of 66. Oh, well, that's why. It's still the grass brush. Excuse me there. Um, yeah. I want to use just a plain brush with the white. And you will see him change. I will blow it up so you can see. Yes. You always want to make sure that you check your tools before you start using them. Make sure you're either white or black or what you need. Make sure your brushes are back to what you need. Because uh, then you'll be like, oh, it's not working. And you know, make sure your opacity and flow is what you need. Every move you make, check because it's going to default from what you used before. And that's why it wasn't doing it because it was blades of grass over him. So um, as you can see from the history, there he was, and that's with the pop, what you want. There he was, and that's with the pop. Just, just a little bit. I do a little more down here. You can make it more dramatic by changing the opacity and flow. Photoshop is amazing because it, it causes you to work in layers every single time. Any action that's ever made out there usually has a, an option to adjust. You can always change your tools to different settings to affect the flow and the hardness and the see-throughness. So, you know, you know what works best for you, but it never hurts to experiment and to try and make mistakes. Just open up a photo one day and try every single possible combination of, of tools and feathering and different modes and blending modes because that's the only way you'll learn what all those tools are capable of doing. So now that I've got Mr. Penguin looking less dull and lifeless, I'm going to layer, flatten the image, and of course save this. Place. Yes, because I love this, what we're doing, and this image is coming along, and this is almost done. So I just keep saving over all the old action-related versions that we've been doing here. Now I'm going to run a brush called Color Pop. I don't remember where I got it from. Um, this brush, this Color Pop brush, I'm going to keep it the same opacity and flow as what the pop what you want, 33 and 66. And I'm just going to make this a little bigger, like, oh, I don't know, 33 or something like that. Maybe even 555. Five, five. And I'm just going to sweep this brush over the dandelions to enhance the yellow just a whisker. So sweep it over, sweep it over. Here's a little before. And here's the after. Before, after. You can just see everything kind of brightened up a little with this color pop brush. And I'm going to flatten 
Next, I'm running a greens brush cool action. And again, I can't remember where I got this from, but this makes the grass a little less yellow. I think the grass is too yellow right now. And so running that, I'm making my brush pretty big, keeping it at 555. I'm going to make my opacity 44 and my flow 66. And again, I'm just kind of running this brush casually over all this grass and adding back some green. I thought that was too yellow. So here's the before. Lots of yellow down there. And here's the green, the after with the more green. Before, yellowish. After, more blue has been added. So if you don't have a greens brush cool, you know, um, brush, action brush, another way to get rid of all that yellow would be to, you know, to select the grass and add in some blue. Or if you have certain tools that, that add just blue, you know, if you know your color palette, you'll know what to add and remove. If things are too green, you can add magenta. If things are too yellow, you can add blue. So if you don't actually own a lot of these actions that I'm using, you can create your own tools or you, you might have other tools. As long as you know what will affect something else color-wise, you're able to alter things by hand as well. So now that I've done my, uh, you know, greens brush cool, I'm going to flatten this because that looks good. And I am going to now run an action called Give Me Greens. And I can't remember where I got that. Um, when I run it, it really changed the whole thing. But I felt that I needed a little more green in the overall image. This is what it was before I ran it. And this is what it is after. But that's too much. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to change that action to about 50% opacity. So that's what it was. And that's with just a 50% of that action give me greens. I'm going to flatten that. There's another action from that same collection called Burst the Blues. I'm going to run that. That's a little extreme again. Um, I think I'll just lower the opacity of that action to about 66%. So that's what it was before I added the blue. And that's after. It's so subtle. Um, but it just... You know, that, that's the direction I want to go in, and I knew that these actions would be able to get me there. Now I'm just going to save this since we've been making a lot of changes. So save, replace, okay, because I like where we're at now. Uh, now that I've added some color, it's actually time to take it out. So I have these brushes that will take out color, especially reds and yellows, because those often come through um, certain images with newborns, with fur, anything white. Uh, again, you may have that in your actions collection. And if not, as I said, use the opposite of the color you're trying to remove. These actions were pretty much doing just that. And whoever created these actions um, made it so that you're actually, you're not really taking out yellow, you're adding in a color over. So blue would get would eliminate yellow. Um, Lightroom uh, is also another way to select a color and remove that color. You can also go up to image adjustments, hue, sat hue saturation, and grab colors that you're trying to get out. Um, but then you would have to select the object. So it's nice to have a brush because you can paint it. Otherwise, you need to use your lasso tool and select you know, the polar bear just to get rid of the yellow only from him. You wouldn't want to get rid of the yellow anywhere else. You want to keep the dandelions yellow, and you want to have a little bit of yellow all over. But if you're just trying to eliminate it, it is nice if you have a brush. So I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to hit this. Um, first, I want to get rid of the red. So I'm going to hit my red out brush on brush. I'm going to use a large size brush, so this is fine here. Opacity, I think I'll make it 55, and the flow 66. Again, so it's not extreme. I'm not taking out all the yellow, or all the red, excuse me. I'm going to just take my brush and sweep it over the bear to get rid of this red. Just take it out where there's some red. I'm not taking out all of it. I'm just kind of just toning it down. So here's what it was. 
He was very red. And again, these brushes are really adding another color on top of it to counteract it. There's a lot of red, there's a little less red. And I think that looks good, so I'm going to flatten. And now I'm gonna do the same thing with this action I have here called Brush Off Yellow Tint. Gonna keep everything the same as the red. I'm gonna sweep this huge brush over the bear, especially where there's a lot of yellow. You can just actually visibly see it starting to remove itself from it. Want to leave a little bit. No bear is perfectly white. And no bear is perfectly clean. Anything white will grab the colors and hues around. You know, it keeps it natural. But he is a lot less colorful now. So again, here's the before, and here's the after before and after I remove the yellow. I think that looks good. Uh, so I'm gonna flatten this. I'll save. Save with this, okay. Now, I am going to run another action called Reduce Vibrancy. This one is from Beyond the Lens. So Beyond the Lens created this. Um, and this right there, Reduce Vibrancy. Uh, another, I'm going to keep my brush big. I'm going to make the opacity about 22%. Keep the flow 66. I'm just going to one more time go over the bear. And this removes any more color or tint that is still too bright. So it's just, it's just kind of reducing that vibrant color. Again, I want to leave a little hue, a little tint, a little color on the bear because he's not perfectly bright, white, and clean. Uh, and there's shadows and highlights because of the lighting situation, but he is way less colorful. So I'm going to flatten that. Now, on to shadows and highlights. Uh, again, you can do it manually with brushes along the side here. Um, you might have a, if you see right here with this little hand, there's a burn tool and a dodge tool. And once you're into those, you can adjust the shadows. You can burn in midtones. You can burn in highlights. I have an action that ha happens to just do all that. So I use this action called Helper Create Depth Brush. Cannot remember where I got that. Um, so I'm running it. And in this particular action, it starts you out with black, which again would be comparable to burning with the hand here. Um, so it's basically a burn tool. And I want to, uh, you know, alter these highlights. So I'm going to keep the opacity about 22 and the flow 66. I just want it to be gradual. And I'm sweeping over the bear where there's a lot of um, blown out areas in his fur. So I'm basically just bringing back his fur in those blown out areas. And if you come to layers and click it, you'll see how it was. I, I wasn't very careful and I kind of moved into the sky, but just to show you. And then in this action, I'm toggling to white, which now brings it to the shadows adjustment. Again, if you did that manually with your Photoshop, right here, you would go to the dodge tool, like this little magnifying glass. This is the same thing embedded in the action. I am going to keep it all the same, and I'm just going to run this action over the shadows a little bit. Again, before, I, before and after. because I wasn't on the brush. Here we go. I'm gonna run that white action and you'll see before, after, before, after. So I opened up the shadows. I darkened down the highlights. That's using my Create Depth brush, which you can get yourself from the side here using dodging and burning tools. Um, I think that looks fine. I'm gonna save it. Flatten it and save it because I was working with an action. Um, then I like to add a mat sometimes. I've already gone through all the mat actions I have, and there were two that I liked. Again, I don't remember where, but one was that I got them from. One was Velvet Finish, and one here is called Muted Haze. And I like a little bit of both, so I'm going to flatten Muted Haze. I'm going to flatten the Velvet Finish. I'm going to mix these two together. 
put the muted haze over the velvet finish and mix them at 52% or 50% opacity. I like how that looks. Then I'm going to take this combo of mattes that I just did, select all, and paste that over what we're working on. And I don't, I don't need it that extreme. Obviously, it's covering up all our edits. I just wanted that look a little bit over what I've done. So I, I'm putting it on about 50%. So as you can see, this is what we just have been working on. Everything I just told you, adding greens, taking out yellow, everything we've done. And now I've added one new step on top of it, the mat. 50% opacity. Like that. I'm going to flatten it. There's this. And I'm going to save. So this photo has a lot of different things going on. But I like where it is, and I would never go back to any of the other stages. That's why I keep saving and replacing. Um, then I have actions that smooth and saturate the shots a bit. So again, I've already gone through them, and there were two I liked. One was called Buttery Blur. That, you know what? This one is actually from Wish Photography. And then there's one, Petal Soft. And this is from Annie Manning's Paint the Moon. <laughs> so there's two different people that have made two different but similar actions. And I like a little of this and I like a little of this. So Wish Photography's Buttery Blur. I'm going to flatten that. I'm going to flatten the Annie Manning's Paint the Moon Petal Soft. And I'm going to combine the two. I like a little of this over a little of that. So about 50%. So I get half and half of both blended together. So we go 50% and flatten this combination of the smooth and saturated actions. Gonna command all, select all, copy and paste this mixture back over what we're working on. And then I think I'll just make it about 33% of passy. So this is what we've been working on. And this is with just a smidge of both of those together. What we've been working on, just a smidge. It just smooths and saturates. Flatten. Save. Save. Replace. Okay. Now, I have an action here called Sky Enhancer. Again, I think this was something I found free. Um, Sky Enhancer, when you run this action, really, it's like an ombre effect. It darkens the top and gets a little lighter as it goes down. I think that's way too extreme, but if I make it about 33% opacity of this action, you will see there it was before, and there's a little, just, it kind of ties it all together. It darkens the top, it connects everything in the highlight area, so before and after. I'm flattening it, and I'm saving it. Save, replace, all. Next, I'm going to run an action called Eye Pop. Yes, they're very far away and their eyes are black, but this will actually sharpen the details, brighten and lighten the eye just a whisker. So I'm running the action. I'm picking a brush that's the right size and just happens to already be that way. I'm going to make the opacity about 44% with a flow of 66 and I'm just going to run this over their eyes, as you can see, what it was, what it is, what it was, what it is. Even maybe on the nose, his eyes fine, but I'm just going to click on it. So it just, even though they're really far away and you might not even notice, you might notice. It's just these subtle little details. Um, I just wanted to open up those shadows a little. I'm going to hit flatten image, so eye pop is done. Save, replace. And then um, my final thing I like to do with, with my pictures is adding a little contrast. And I have an action here called Contrast Snap. Again, there's so many ways to achieve contrast. You can get it through your curves and your levels, but I just use an action. And that's pretty extreme. I don't want it that contrasty. So again, I'm going to change the opacity the action came to to about 33% instead. That's what it was. That's what it is. See, it just pops it a little bit. 
save, and flatten. Flatten and save, I mean. Got to do it in that order. Um, now, I think that pretty much is it, what I do with my workflow. There's a few little tweaks. You know, I might want to get a little more yellow out of him. Uh, so I would you know, maybe go back to the brush off yellow tint brush. Um, I might, you know, you might want to darken this fur on his leg. Um, so for that, I might just use my burn tool. And because it's in the shadows, I'll make sure it says shadows up here. And I'm just going to darken that down. They got a little bit too light in all our different things we're doing. I might want to add a little drop shadow in the grass where the penguin is standing to give it depth and a shadow from the sun. So I would just come up to mid-tones and just, just sweep this underneath him. I mean, you can barely see, but there it was, and there it is. Just a little shadow that the penguin might cast if he's standing there in the sun. Um, so, and there's another thing too, like if you're, you know, want to do these final little tweaks and stuff, um, I might use my command M, which is curves, you know, brighten this overall image, add a little contrast by sliding this over. So see the penguin darken up, just a little contrast. I might want to add some magenta because I think it's a little too green, this image. So I would just pull down a whisker of magenta to warm it up. Here's what a lot of magenta would do. And I'm just adding a little bit. Just to, I don't know, just to warm it up a little. Um, and one other thing, a lot of times something that's white will reflect or pick up or absorb all the colors around it. So I'm going to use my lasso tool here, this little squiggly. I'm going to use a feather of about 22%. And I'm going to select this little area around his leg. Maybe go in a little closer. It has a lot of blue that he's absorbed. And then you're going to go under Image. You're going to do the pull down of Adjustments, the pull down of Hue Saturation. And you're going to select Cyan because that's what's showing up in his leg. And I'm going to do about, oh, I don't know, lightness of 33 that gets rid of it, and saturation of negative 33, which also gets rid of it. You can play with all these sliders to add maybe back some yellow. If you move the hue, it'll it'll alter it. But, you know, I just felt that those two numbers were good. But, again, if you know the opposite color that you're trying to remove, you can go in and, and select things with your lasso tool, and, and and that's another trick to just get rid of a color that you don't want only in one little area. So I'm going to hit OK. Um, I'm going to save, replace, OK. And finally, um, I have an action here called Beautifully Desaturated. This is a Jessica Drossen action. And I'm going to run that over the whole entire image, which is really desaturated it way too much. But I just want to take a twinge out of the whole overall image of brightness. So I'm going to make the opacity about 22%. And so that's what my image was before I ran Beautifully Desaturated. And there it is after. I mean, it's so subtle, but it's it's just enough. And I'm going to flatten. And I'm going to save replace. Um, again, these are all the actions I've purchased and stocked up on over the years, but I am actually in the process of creating my own Photoshop actions that will greatly reduce how many I run and how many I use. So now that I know my style, you know, I've been working on making a set of actions that will combine many of these elements that I just showed you. And um, obviously when I finally finish, I do plan on releasing those and they will be in the order of the workflow that I just showed you. So stay tuned for that. But um, again, everyone has their own way of going about something. And I hope that with one or two of even what I've showed you, you can have something similar or create something similar or find something similar in order to achieve the same look. Um, now, I think I'm done. I feel that that's okay. Um, and at this point, with this final edited image, I might also make a black and white version if it calls for it. 
and or a painterly version of this using my Topaz Impression Paint program, which is right down here. This is a plug-in program that I bought separately um, that works with Photoshop. Or I might even create a version that has a texture over it. So I will show you um, also how what a texture could do and how to add a texture. Um, so you have your finished product. I'm going to save it one more time. I'm going to make a duplicate copy of this because I don't want to alter my final version. Um, and I'm going to open up my texture. Again, it's just simply like opening up any other photo, but I'm going to go to, you know, you can go to File, Open, but I, I have it right here, and I'm just going to drag it into Photoshop. This is a texture called Storybook Cover Texture 1. You can find this in my online store under the Storybook Cover Texture set. So I will show you that. Um, the storybook cover texture set are right here. These are 12 different textures that you can apply to your images to kind of give them a fairy tale look, or you can add your images onto the template. Um, these are just old book cover textures that I like to use. So now you have your texture here. I'm going to select all. So Command A or copy all, anything, any way you need to be able to grab this, do. I'm going to copy and cut, and I'm going to paste this over my image. Command V. And now I'm going to grab my move tool, and again, position the texture wherever I want it. In this case, I want it over the whole image. Make sure all the edges are correct. You want to apply so you can hit the check mark or you can double click and of course I can't see what you know what I'm doing because it just plopped down in the normal mode so you're going to switch that to screen mode or two other modes I often like when I'm uh, adding a texture are soft light or overlay mode so there's you know check your blending modes what is the look that you want to do um, but I'm going to use screen, and I'm going to make the opacity about 66%, so I'm changing the texture opacity to 66. Now, that's really dulled out my underlying image, so I'm going to select the background layer only, the original print that it's over, and I'm going to bring back some contrast and depth from underneath this cloudy, busy texture. So I'm going to go Command M. I'm going to open my curves. And I'm going to adjust this layer underneath the texture. Oh, I'm not affecting the texture. I'm just affecting the background original layer. And I'm going to darken it. I'm going to bring back some contrast. I'm going to darken it a little more. I can add some color to it. Maybe I felt that the overlay had too much blue in it or whatever. You can add color. You can adjust this background layer however you want without affecting this texture. As long as in your layers palette, you, you click on background only. Once I have it looking good, if I feel that there's too much texture over the animals, I will go back to my texture layer. You're going to hit your add layer mask button down here, the square with the circle. You're going to make sure that your black brush is selected. You're going to choose an opacity. So 33%. Eh, I think I'll make the flow 33% as well because I just want to gently and gradually brush off some texture. I want it to be almost discreet. If I made opacity and flow 100, all of this that I'm brushing off would be completely clear with no texture at all. I mean, you can certainly do whatever you want, but I just, I want to bring them out a little bit, but I still want to leave texture on them. And so now I'm going to brush over the penguin, I'm going to brush over the bear, I'm going to make my brush a little bigger too. Um, as you can see, it's leaving all the texture. It's just popping the subject and getting rid of a little texture to, to kind of make them more visible. Here's before I did that. And here's after I did that. So it's it's super subtle. The texture's still all over them. I just kind of made them pop again. 
and you can do that anywhere in the, in where you would like. And once you get your texture how you want, you would just flatten it and save this particular image and I would save it as the word texture at the very end so I know that I, I applied a texture move to this. And there you go. Now, finally, I personally love using, especially with like whimsical, um, you know, images like this, I like using a paint, my paint program. So I, sh I will open it and show you what this looks like. Again, this is called Topaz Impression Paint Program. It's a plugin. It should work with, uh, for sure it works with Photoshop. And I believe this was $100. And I might have gotten it on sale, but I think it was, yeah, $100. And oh my gosh, it was worth, it's worth every penny because whatever you import, it gives you all these pre-done effects. So here is just a, you know, a run through it. It shows all the different painting effects on this particular tree here that, you know, Da Vinci and Van Gogh and there's, there's oil paintings and sketches, Renoir, Monet. They're all what the painter would achieve. And it's, I absolutely love this, especially because I love to give my animals a painterly effect too. So I am, I've already run through this and I already threw all these, like there's like a hundred different looks here. I've already chosen the ones that I like. I just wanted to show you what that program looked like. And I ended up coming away with this. After tweaking all the sliders and blending this with other paintings and I ended up liking this. I like it so much that I want to take a little bit of this and add it over the image that we finished. I feel this is almost too real looking. So I'm going to select all, copy, and paste. Of course, okay, now I have the same painting over my image and I'm going to change the opacity to 44%. So as you can see, I, I'm keeping it real giving it a little painterly feel. And then I have this version too, which I'm going to post and sell or whatever. But it, you know, the painting program to me sometimes, I mean, even if it's like 10% of it just incorporated into my image, that's a look that I enjoy. So you should go out there and research, you know, different plugins and, and different filters because there might be a look that you want to, you know, turn your image into that you might not have a lens for. So this is a great way to cheat. And I certainly could never paint this. So, so that's a, a, you know, an after effect look that I do like to use. And so there you go. This is my finished product. And I will reopen what we started with. And there's our finished product. So before and after. And, um, Honestly, yay, <laughs> we're done. But it goes much quicker than, than in this tutorial because I kept stopping and explaining things in detail for you. And I tried to work slowly for you to be able to see what I was doing. But once you have a routine down and you know how to do all these little tricks and tweaks and you're very comfortable and familiar with your computer and all your tools, you know, it's, it's just going to become second nature and you're going to fly through your edits. You'll be able to do them with your eyes closed. I mean, you know, I... It's actually hard to slow down and tell you what I'm doing because I just do it so naturally and you do it every day. And, you know, when you're actually thinking about it, I had to stop and think for a minute like, oh, where's this tool? Where's this tool? Because it will become second nature if you practice, practice, practice and do it all the time. Um, so I really hope that you enjoyed doing that. Thank you for sitting here this long. But I really hope that you came away with even one or two things. I hope it helps you out in your own editing process. You know, I hope you learned some new tips or tricks or techniques. And most important, I really hope I helped you learn to love your editing a little bit more. So thank you so much for watching. Um, please contact me on my Facebook page. You can find me at Carrie Ann Griffel Pike. Um, or you can email me at capturedbycarrieann at gmail.com. So that's C-A-P-T-U-R-E-D by Carrie Ann at gmail.com if you ever have any questions. 
You can also reach out to me on my Facebook fan page here, Capture by Carrie Photography. And there's a little button here called Contact Me. So you can contact me that way. Um, and also, uh, in my online store here, if you come over to Contact, you can reach me this way. And then there's a question and answer terms of use. And um, this also has lots more information, help, tips, tricks, questions, answers, all in this FAQ section. Um, and, and this explains what programs that my products work in, what software you need to be able to use overlays and textures, um, also how you correctly use overlays, textures and digital backgrounds, and my terms of use. And just in case you had any questions um, once you download your free Polar Bear uh, overlay or background actually. So I really hope that you enjoy your freebie digital polar bear. I would love to see your creations using it and you know applying some of these tips and tricks that I taught you. So please 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 feel free to post your work on my Facebook fan page. Again you just go to my wall and you can post it here. It'll show up down here and I will you know I'll happily share your work and stuff. So uh, I thank you again for sticking with me and happy editing. Okay, bye.